Hello. Estamos online. Yeah. Uh, he hello. Thanks everybody for joining us today uh, in this uh, conversation. Uh, my name is Jose Luis Aparicio. I'm a QA filmmaker, critic, and curator. Uh, this this conference, this conversation is part of a uh, Land Without Images: The Absent in Cuban Cinema, which is a Cuban cinema retrospective a retrospective of alternative independent Cuban cinema that we are showing here since last Friday until the 17th. Um, it, is a, it is a retrospective of almost 100 hours of uh, Cuban independent or alternative filmmaking during the past 60 years. And we are also making this, uh, this like theoretical event. Every day we have a, a conference or a conversation in order to reconstruct the narrative of alternative filmmaking in Cuba for the past, past six decades. Uh, and today we are going to talk about the Cuban cinema of the 70s and 80s, uh, the alternative Cuban cinema of those decades. And the subtitle of the conversation is uh, performance and uh, self-representation, because I think in those decades, uh, Cuban cinema became very different uh, uh, from what was before, uh, the, the official, the canonical Cuban cinema that was mainly uh, social melodramas, comedy of manners, films about the history of the revolution, about the history uh, of Cuba, uh, the colonial history. There were, there were uh, almost uh, um, epic films, uh, films, propaganda films, films about the, the heroes, the martyrs, uh, the revolution. And I think in these decades, uh, some filmmakers, like the ones we're going to talk uh, to today, um, started exploring new territory uh, in experimental filmmaking. They became interested in representing themselves in cinema. The individual uh, took the center, like the subject was um, more intimate, more private, more personal. They were trying to, like, I think, uh, maybe unconsciously, but trying to deconstruct the, this idea that you always have to talk about Cuba uh, immersed in the bigger uh, in the bigger narrative, in the historical framework of its time. These people were talking about the individual, the the most intimate problems, the most intimate conflicts, and they were talking about that in a new language, also a language closer to uh, avant-garde cinema of the 70s and 80s uh, in United States and Europe. They were exploring new new territory, new aesthetic territory for Cuban cinema. Uh, so we're going to talk about these works. They are very different works, but I think very similar in spirit. I'm going to present the, 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 the filmmakers that are going to talk today with us here in Castle. We, we have Fernando Villaverde and Minuca Villaverde. They are a, a couple of filmmakers. They've been working and living together since the 60s. They began uh, their work in Icaic in the official film institute in Cuba, where they made uh, beautiful short films and documentaries that were censored at its time because uh, they portrayed Cuban reality in a more um, in a more subjective nature. They were not interested in talking about the revolution as the center of their stories, of their characters. They were talking about the individuals. They, uh, they created a more uh, intimate and melancholic cinema about doubt, about, um, uh, about how the individual takes this, all these big social changes and, and how that, I think, um, uh, um, has to do with their lives, how that, infl um, how that affects their life. And they uh, left Cuba uh, during 1965, if I'm, if I'm correct. 65. And they went to a, an exile until today and they worked uh, making cinema in New York and later Miami. And today we're going to talk about the cinema they made, they created after they left Cuba, which was very different to the cinema that they uh, did in Icaic. So they reinvented themselves as experimental filmmakers, avant-garde filmmakers uh, in the New York experimental scene of the late 60s, early 70s. And also joining us from Zoom, we have uh, Ricardo Acosta, who I think uh, is listening to us right now. Ricardo, uh, can you listen to us? Ricardo Acosta is a filmmaker. Uh, he's uh, very associated to the generation of the 80s in Cuba, the young generation of filmmakers, like the filmmakers born uh, with the Cuban revolution, 
because they started making films when the revolution had like 20 years or so, and they were also that age, so they were like the first filmmakers that were uh, formed by the Cuban revolution. They, they, they weren't for, uh, formed before. And he, he, he's also a, an editor, a documentarian, a, a, a very round filmmaker, and he worked in some of the most important films of his generation, and he's, um, he, 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 he can give us um, so many stories and information about those uh, years. And we also have Irene Lopez. I don't know if Irene can listen to us. She will yes, only I, be I can. Us, um, in, a, in, in an audio format because she has problems with her camera, but she will give us also her insights because she worked as an actress, there as a director, as a young director in Ikai. She was a woman director, which was not very typical in Cuba. It's not very typical today. Women working inside the industry, the official film industry. And she created very experimental work also uh, inside some of the most uh, rigid frameworks. For example, the newsreel, uh, el noticiario Italia Latinoamericano, el CAIC newsreel, which was a very official um, propaganda newsreel. And she created some beautiful films, some very uh, experimental films inside that framework. And she also suffered censorship as Ricardo. So we are we're going to start talking uh, and we're going to build this timeline because I think it's very interesting how the, the work that Minyoka Fernando created in the United States in, the, in exile uh, is similar in spirit to this experimental, um, I don't know, this experimental approach that the, 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 these young filmmakers of the 80s, like Ricardo and Irene, started making in Cuba 10 years ago. And there wasn't a connection between these generations because the people like Minyoka and Fernando left the country, never had any influence or contact or dialogue with the next generation, but there was like the, the necessity of uh, creating films that were very different from the canonical classic propaganda films uh, made by Kike. So um, this is kind of an introduction. Sorry if it took to, uh, so long because I, I really want to listen what they, what, what, they, what, they, what they have to say. So thank you all for being here. And I'm going to, to give the word to Fernando and after Minuga for the to, to talk about this uh, reinvention. I want to, uh, to ask you, after you left Ikaik, after, after you left Cuba in 1965 and discovered the New York experimental underground cinema scene, um, what happened to you? How that changed you? What kind of films did you want to make at the time? Uh, how you reshaped yourself as a, an exile experimental filmmaker in another country? Um, talk about that and, and the movies you started making like Apollo, Man to the Moon, A Ladies Home Journal and Fernando 21 films that we've shown here yesterday and today in, the, in our exhibition? Well, I think, uh, first of all, we discovered the films of the underground scene in New York. We started seeing these films. We had not seen these films before. We saw what they were doing. It was a complete change for us to see these people that were doing films just with a camera, just with their families or what they could find in the street, their ideas, no actors sometimes, or if they had actors, they were their friends and they were, it was a completely different cinema. And when we started working, I think our style was born out of this example, but also out of necessity. We had no budget, we had nothing. We bought a camera and it was a Bolex, a very good camera, but we bought the cheapest Bolex, a Bolex which had a view viewer, no through lens or anything like that, no electric winds, anything. And what did we do? The first thing we did was Apollo. We went out in the street and started trying out the camera. We shot things in the street, we shot people, we shot buildings, we shot anything we found. And after weeks of shooting, we said, we saw what we had done and we said, let's do a film with this. So the film had been begun without a purpose, just like uh, aleatory shots. And then after that, we said, let's have a purpose and let's build a film with this. We, that doesn't, doesn't mean we wrote a script or anything like that. 
We had an idea, more or less, of what we wanted. We discussed it. And then we be began shooting also outside and also in our house and also ourselves, but with a little purpose. And little by little, the film started making itself until it was built. We, and then at the end, we said, we are lacking this, we put this, we will put this, and that will make our film complete. And we did it like that. That meant that the film costed very, very little. And the second step you said was mentioned, you mentioned working in our house with ourselves. That was also the same thing, out of necessity. We, I, we started thinking, when I wanted to make a film, I said to myself, what film do I want to make? I did a lady some journal, it was a story, and I said, well, one actress, and I can shoot it at home. It was an idea that came out by itself with one character and shooting at home. And it was, like I tell you, it was not something that we said, we are going to reinvent our cinema and we are going to do this or that. Circumstances moved us more than anything. The, and that dictated the way we shot and the way we filmed, I think. But you, you were saying yesterday also that this, this experimental scene uh, gave you the sense of freedom that you didn't, uh, that maybe you, you know that in Ikai, you made your films that you wanted to make them, but you know there were limits and that's why the, the films got censored. And you also needed an infrastructure to make them because you work with actors, you needed money for the production, you needed uh, so many things, and you needed to go through all that official channels in order to make your film. And, that was the, and there was also the idea of compromising some aspects in order to make it or maybe making the film and, and after that never get released because the film gets censored. So in how many, in, in how many ways or, or, or how this new approach to cinema change your, your, uh, your, your, your idea of what a film could be or what films you can do. This, that this sense of freedom that this experimental scene maybe gave you. Well, the but, main thing is that we wanted to make films. That was the main problem. We wanted to make films because it had been a period of about three years after leaving Cuba in which we hadn't done anything because of the, the establishing ourselves in exile. And then when we said, we want to make films, we said, how do we do it? We found this inspiration, let's say, in the underground scene. We had seen several avant-garde films from France in the 20s and 30s, but that didn't have, even if they were experimental thing, films, they had nothing to do with what was the underground New York or California a, a film experience. It was com that was completely different. And these filmmakers showed us to do that. These filmmakers work at, in their houses with their friends, with the with what they saw immediately. They had films that were nothing, like shooting a, a garden, and they knew how to shoot a garden and give that a special meaning, a special signification. And that was what we said, well, if we don't have anything of what we had before and we want to make films, let's follow their example. And let's do the films exactly this way. Let's search our own way in this way. <laughs> and we, we work with that, with what we found ourselves. Yeah, I, w I want to listen to Minuka's uh, opinion of, of this. And I'll also ask her about the, the, perf the perfor uh, performatic nature of some of the work you did in those years because you directed the films you wrote them you also acted in the films and there is like a theatrical element a performatic element in some of these films uh, I think there is some uh, theater some performance even some relation to erotica in some of the films like you were exploring new territory and using even like I want you to talk about the process of making films like uh, Blanca Putica and Poor Cinderella uh, like um, like working with yourself, taking like something from reality and retelling that through your sensibility and, and, and how can you achieve that mixture, that mixture between cinema, performance, theater, 
um, and also be, being uh, talking about self-representation because you were working with Fernando, you were working with your with your children. So tell me about that. Oh, okay, everything is so complicated among men. I never ask no question like that. I was doing that because I wanted to do something. When we left Cuba, we went to New York. Most, of, I think it was, but anyway. And I was at home taking care of my kids. I used to be a teacher, math teacher, but I always like film. We learn. Let me tell you something. I remember Cuba and the Ikai with great pleasure. I know they ban our films. I know that, but they allow us to do to make those films. At the end, okay, but we learn a lot in Cuba. The young people doing film and getting together to discuss about film. We used to watch film every single week. And I remember watching Antonioni and the Russian film and the French film. And then I, I am happy because of that. When we left Cuba, I was not a filmmaker. I was acting with him. But then we love film. That's something I took from my, my staying in the, my being at the Ikai. Whatever happened is that we said, let's do something here. We bought the camera, as he said, a very simple camera, bullets, and I learned to use it. And then I had a little corner in my living room. It was in a very nice place, very small, but very nice. And I put a curtain. And I said, this is for me. And I have a table and I have a little splice, no? Mm. A splicer and winders and everything, you know. And so very, edit. very simple, the, very simple. The, the basic things for editing, basic, very basic. Very basic, right. And then I said, let me film something. I started filming, what happened? I started filming the, the building from my window. That was the first thing I did, how the lights changed, how the, everything I saw through the window. That's the most simple thing to do. But then I concentrated on that. Then I took the, I went to a party, a, what is it, Italian festivities, and I took all what they were doing there. And the third part of the film was me living with my two kids and my family. So there were three parts. The name of the film was Love Will Never Come. That film had disappeared. It was destroyed. I don't know what happened. But after that, I started doing something else. And as he said, I was doing something like a Blanca Putica that you, I think you saw today. Some people saw it today. Not because I wanted to show my body. Not because I wanted to do an erotic thing is because I read a news from Paris which said that a girl, a prostitute from Yugoslavia, they, the man, the writer called her Blanca Putica, which means little white whore, and was killed and found in the same. For me, that was something so sad. Also, the name he, did, he gave to her was pretty sad, and I said, oh my God, we, uh, we, we are born, women are born, and we want to be beautiful, we want to be happy, we want to find a man or whatever to love, and at the end, this man killed her. That was so sad, that's why I made that film that they showed today, and I said, I will do something for her. For me, it was so sad to see the film today, because it was 50 years ago, and I was thinking of that woman, I was thinking of me, and I say, oh my God, that, for me, that was a beautiful film. I don't know if it's well done, I don't know if it's a masterpiece, I don't know if it's a piece of shit. I don't know what it is, but for me, it's so great. And then, after that film, what I did was this, I took all the leftover, leftover from the film, and I didn't want to throw it away. So I recycled it. Let's say, I took a little piece of the film, my face, my body, and I scratched black leather, and then I spliced those little pieces in the, in the transparent leather I got. <clears throat> and I was making like frame by frame, like a little, a little painting. And I was 
moving it to see how it would look when you move it and you see a film. And that's the, the result is that film, Cinderella, is the, like the daughter of Blanca Putica. And after that, I was working for Fernando there together. Uh, but we never got money. I only got, right. um, I only got uh, prizes from the New York Council on the Arts. <clears throat> and they gave me a group of women to teach them. And we did a beautiful thing in New York together. And after that, I didn't do no more because no money. We didn't have no money. And I didn't want to work for the TV. I didn't want to work for nothing. We left for Miami. Well, and in Miami. Can I say something? Yeah. Before leaving for Miami, can I say something? Right. That has to do with New York. And I, it's a parenthesis between in your, what you're saying. The way I spoke about the beginning of our work and the way you speak about what you did with the, your films, I think creates, it's true, but it creates a wrong image in, some, in a way. It wasn't that serious. We didn't walk, it was, we weren't that serious when we worked. For us, it was a game. We were playing. We didn't, because we didn't have a purpose of showing that film in a cinema. We had the purpose of showing it in like underground showcases in places that you, anyone could come and show a film they had done, anyone. And for us, it was a game and we played around with film. We played around with one. When you did Blanca Potica, when I did that, when we, uh, we did Apollo, but whenever, we were having fun, a lot of fun, and we saw the film that we developed. Now, look at this, look at this, and we were surprised, and we laughed, and we had a lot of, uh, you know, fun editing and putting things together. We didn't have a big purpose. We had the purpose of having a lot of fun with what we did and doing the things, the most beautiful things we were able to do, the things we wanted to do beautifully, but... That was it. It was more a, more of a game than what we have, you and I have given the impression, I think. Well, okay, uh, the, during our... Am I right? Yes. <laughs> the, the thing that happened in New York is that at the time, the 70s and the 60s, there were a lot of... 70s. Art, 70s, a lot of artists over there, music, musicians, filmmaking, a, a lot, a lot of artists working together. And we used to go to all those places to listen to the music by La Montellor, Son Ra, and so and so. And all the filmmakers we met there, like Bruce Bailey, um, Jonas Mecca, and all those people were so creative, so great, that a little, a little piece of them I took from them. And I, I really think that's why I made film, because of those people also from the beginning in Cuba. And then after we went to Miami, I, I received the, the notice, the news that the Cuban people were coming from Mariel. And I wanted to see them. I went to see, they had like a tent for them, the government, had a tent for those people who didn't have no house, no nothing. And I, I fell in love with them. So I made another film called Tent City about those people. They became my friend. I became their friend. It cost a money for us. Uh, but a lot of people from the Cuban people who used to work in cinema before Castro or with Castro, living in Miami helped me and gave me the moviola, the sound. I, I almost, I didn't have to pay anything in making that film because they helped me a lot. After that, I said to Fernando, well, I stopped making film because you, you don't have to work hard for me to make film and I don't know how to find the money. So I said I stop and I did stop. What happened now is that I am, I am an old person 
and I feel like I want to do something. I cannot make film. I, I don't even know how to, to use the, the videos and things like that. So one day I decided I have to do something to create something before I die. And, and I started drawing, drawing little things. I don't know how to draw, but I just started drawing things. And then little pieces of the thing I am doing is like a little film. It has some story, something to say. And that made me so happy, and I am happy you are here. And I am sorry if my film are not perfect, if I'm not professional, but it's my life, and I have been so happy with film. I learned to love film. I learned to love film, and I, it's something which is within myself, which is life. And I am alive, and thank you so much. Thank you, thank you both. Can I, can I put a footnote, another footnote? Yeah, you can, you Maybe. can. Yeah. <clears throat> Yesterday, you asked me a question. It has to do with what she said now. Yesterday, you, had, you asked me about the legacy of Ikaik. And I th answered that I, uh, besides some specific works, I saw no legacy. And I still believe that if you think on the body of work, but I think Ikaik has left us with a huge legacy. And that is the legacy of introdu like introducing film as an important part of art in Cuban life. Ikaik really, until then, film had been very commercial, very poor, it was something. And Ikaik gave the Cuban art seen the idea of working in film and since then every generation of Cuban young people have worked in film and if for example I am here and you are here and we are we have uh, seen our films you saw mine I saw yours and the people or the young people of your generation and we have created a link that is the legacy of Ikaik I think yeah, yeah, that's a beautiful idea because Ikai, as you said, they, they maybe they didn't um, protect that, uh, they didn't protect that as much as they should, but they said cinema is an art, and that was new, and, and maybe uh, that was like uh, <laughs> dangerous for them afterwards because everybody took it by heart that cinema is an art, so I'm gonna make uh, the, the cinema I want to do without restraints, uh, and that was a problem for them afterwards. But that idea, that virus spread from generation to generation. And to, to, to put like a, a, a partial conclusion on what you were saying, I think that this, I, I, I see it as a reinvention. Maybe you didn't uh, think it as consciously in, back then, but that reinvention you, 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 go, you went through when you went into exile, I think it's beautiful because you had so little resources and you used the most intimate, the most private, your home, your family, in order to um, to talk about uh, the whole world, and I love uh, in films like a Ladies Home Journal and Blanca Budica, uh, how you uh, take your home, the space of your home, and transform that in a very um, uh, art, artisan, artisanal. I don't know how to put it, in a very um, very creative way. You create there so many spaces. You create there so many sets with practically nothing with a, a piece of cheat and some, and some plants. And that's a beautiful idea of how your home can contain the whole world. You didn't have money to go into sets, to go maybe into the streets to find actors, but to use yourselves. And you, you, had, uh, you, 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 you could represent everything in that small space. And I think that's a, a testament of the imagination of the filmmaker. This is the space we have, but we can do anything here. We are not restrained by it. Uh, and also, the film that you did about the, the problem of exile, uh, like to my father and then 10 city, from the most personal and private uh, way to talk about exile, the death of a father far away from home, and how that the family gets affected by that absence and the last days of, of the patriarch. And afterwards, uh, with 10 city in a more collective way, these people that were like left uh, out, like uh, expelled from Cuba, and how did you find them as a family? 
uh, in those 10 houses in Miami. I think that's beautiful. And I think that gives us um, a way to introduce our, our, our other um, guests in Zoom. Because at the time that people left Cuba in the 80s, at the Mariel, the country was divided. You were uh, filming and talking about the people that were left out of the country that were not part of the revolution anymore. The, the revolution didn't want them. And filmmakers like Ricardo and Irene uh, were started making films in the 80s. They were the people that stayed in the country and wanted to be creative, and wanted to make their own films and represent themselves as much as you were doing that in, in New York. So I want to listen to Ricardo, my dear friend Ricardo. Are you there? Can you listen to us? Hello? Or maybe Irene? Do you listen to me? Do you, can you hear me? Irene? Ah, I'm listening, Irene. Take a seat. Can you hear me? Sí, I can hear you. Perfect. You can ask me quite any questions. <laughs> Irene? Yeah. Yeah. Can you, well, thank you for being here. Can you talk us a bit about your experience making films in Cuba in the 80s, about your, your, your time in Ikaik and the, the different films you made uh, for yourself or uh, inside the framework of uh, Noticiero Ikaik Latinoamericano, the official newsreel by Santiago Álvarez? Can you tell, tell us about your experiences and what kind of films you, you like to make and you were trying to make back then? Uh, well, uh, first of all, I have to thank you and the Star uh, for having me. It's, it's a very emotional moment to me to be close to uh, filmmakers that uh, uh, like Fernando. And uh, I also try to be a little bit closer to Orlando Jimenez Leal. He knew about my film. He was surprised because... Um, as you can hear from uh, Ricardo Acosta and me, uh, at the e if you pushed, you could do certain things as long as you follow your instinct, your ethics. Now, you had to live with the consequences, which were that you were not promoted, you were not traveling, representing Cuba, or things like that, because for you, it was more important to be a fair, to reflect reality, to start saying different things in a different way. And that's why um, every little thing I see and every great thing I see, uh, like uh, what I have seen from Orlando Jimenez Leal, from Nestor Almendros, I think that has something very close to you, uh, the new generation, and to some of us who try to break the ice and uh, fight with whatever we have. In my case, I was uh, I come from from TV. I was an actress. Uh, later, I directed, um, you know, stories and um, uh, episodes in series. So I had a great um, background of of about, you know, on performing and on directing, but I learned so much at, at ICAI. Art was so important there that I started again being a assistant to, to Santiago Alvarez and to other filmmakers with uh, um, whom I, I learned it. I learned a lot. So that was the prestige of the, of the Institute of Art and Cinematography, how professionalism um, was, you know, uh, presiding every film. And that's something that uh, marked me. And I'm, I will always be grateful for, for those, for the people I, I, I met, for the people I work with. And I would say that Santiago, and uh, Julio, they let me do stuff. But of course it was crazy, but if you have to do it, you have to do it. And I appreciate so much that you rescued um, olfato mutilado, sense of smell, oh, mutilated sense of smell, 
uh, because that was something that still I have to fight for. And let me tell you something, I have never considered myself a feminist. Why? Because I wanted to consider myself a human being that fought uh, through, you know, among men for being at the top, for, for being uh, always working, always, always giving um, whatever I had to, to give. But I think that the Me Too movement has to start at the ICAIC and among everybody that has been trying to say something and couldn't express it openly. Not because they didn't finish their, their, their jobs, because all you young filmmakers have done it in a very creative way by yourself, not even at the ICAIC, where we had so many resources. But uh, it's like uh, women that were raped uh, 20 years before, and only after 20 years, they are able to say it. And that's what's happening with me. I have been transforming myself, reinventing myself to, uh, you know, work in great places, uh, in capitalist countries, something that nobody told me how to do. Uh, when I was in Cuba, and it, it has been hard because I'm an artist. I need to create. I understand Minuka, and I know what what for for certain women is how hard it is not being able to to give birth to to so many children that we have in our heart and in our in our brains. But uh, that takes me to what I want to say. Sometimes people don't realize how bad is censorship. They censor themselves. They are not even able to be solidarian for, with others. And that's why some critics, some researchers, some um, uh, bureaucrats at the ICAI prefer to, you know, please uh, the authorities instead of seeing everything openly with the light of a, of a, a, a real, you know, a humanist, like the ICAIC transform itself little by little. So why those who made possible a new vision at the Noticiero ICAIC, at the newsreel, and, and we try to say things differently, why they stop Noticiero guy right there when there is that transformation that should have been nurtured, uh, you know, embraced and never was. Why? Because they thought it was against their interests, the worst interest of being okay with the authorities. Uh, whereas, as you have seen and as you have said, the everything, all the cinematographic movement that uh, uh, the ICAIC developed should have been openly studied, noting that we couldn't continue with comedies to release tensions, just to say that we were uh, funny and we have uh, we had uh, uh, the freedom of creating uh, new stuff we need to also say things in a serious manner. And as some of you, I think Fausto Canel and, um, and Fernando Villaverde and, and some other, uh, well, of course, Nestor Almendros did at their time, which was, you know, a dramatic view or a subtle view, but reference with all the, um, you know, the the sort of vision of something that was smelling bad already. So uh, there is there is the need to acknowledge how much harm was done on people who had the possibility of saying stuff very creatively and reduce themselves to be pleasing authorities because you can see the scripts you can see how everything was stopped at one point women 
were fighting with their husbands because they wanted to be free, everything against macho, machism, but they didn't go further. So all the story of uh, the storytelling uh, in, in the scripts that were developed uh, during those years, during the 80s, uh, with the, you know, with the absolute um, exception of uh, Titon, Sara Gomez, or documentaries uh, made by Nicolasito, people were, you know, holding themselves. They didn't cross the line. And it's not their fault. It's, it's just something that grows in you. I have to be careful. And that's a crime. I'm not accusing anyone specifically because stalinism is something that uh, you know goes around the world even in hollywood productions you can see that you cannot upset certain producers so it's it's in the is in the the spirit of of human beings but we have to acknowledge that and that uh, in that me too movement i'm talking about where young filmmakers that haven't been part of the Institute of Art and Cinematography have been so brave as to say stuff by using their own resources. Well, me, after so many years, as I said, reinventing myself in other, like uh, thanks to Canada, I, I could do many things there. I, I, I won grants. I was part of the, of the very vibrant Film, film industry. I was a film critic, all of that. I, I'm very grateful for that. But the United States is something else. I'm not young anymore. Uh, it, there's a lot of competition, great people out there. So I sometimes I'm sad and I am trying to save my health for producing in the future. So I say all this just, uh, you know, trying to, to make points and, and discuss but uh, with lots of uh, hopes and uh, um, um, o o overall, I'm very grateful for having the opportunity of being with you guys. Uh, I think that Star is, is something so remarkable. This uh, documental work that you, Aparicio, and, and uh, Tania Bruguera have been doing that I don't have words. I, I cannot believe it. I feel like Ricardo that so emotional about it. And uh, I, this is all I wanted to share with you. That's very beautiful. And now I want to pass the word to Ricardo. Ricardo, can you hear me? Are you, are you here, Ricardo? Can you talk? Maybe you have your mic off. Are you there? <laughs> I, I think you have, uh, she, he doesn't have a good connection now. Uh, well, w w let us know if you can change something there uh, in order for us to hear you. I can see you, but not hearing you. Well, I, I'm going to continue. Let, let me know if you can re-enter, please. Um, well, uh, to come back to you here, uh, waiting for Ricardo. Um, <laughs> do, do you think that the, the films you, you, you made outside of Cuba uh, like the experimental work you did, if you, you, do you think if you have stayed in Cuba 
and not left into exile, you would have been able to make them? Like this kind of private film, home films uh, about yourself, about your family, this kind of intimate portrayal, not the films of, um, about the, the great stories of the revolution and the social turmoil or, or that, do you think? No, I don't think so because uh, there is something, there was something around us in New York and in the world, but, but not in Cuba, that made us make those films. In Cuba, no, not because of Cuba or the government, it because, no, it didn't have nothing to do with what was happening in the rest of the world. Although, whatever happened in Cuba is a consequence of whatever happened in the Pero rest ando. of the world. But no, never, never, ever, I would have done something like I was doing in New York or whatever, I don't know. Not in Cuba. Cuba is something else. I will for me something else. But remember, listen. It was it was something that happened to me in New York and to Fernando. That was like uh, going to another kind of society with another kind of people, and that make us react. And we are re react that way. In Cuba, maybe we would not have reacted that way, I think. No, I, I, before, uh, just one little bit idea in order to, to have. Do you think then that this conflict or this problem that some people talk about when artists that go into exile from any country and they talk about the, the, the difficulty of making art, in this case films, outside of their home country, outside of the, the environment they already know since they are uh, children, since they were born. Do you think the problem of rootlessness or uprooting was not a problem for you? Because you, 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 find, you found a way to adapt to every new environment you find. The, 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 did you have this problem that if I'm not in Cuba, I won't, I, won't, I won't be able to make art? Because some people talk about that sometimes, that they need their home country for, for creating. Talk about, I just wanted to add that to the, to the the already formed question. Well, I think. Hello, hello, hello. The answer, Uno, dos, tres, my, my case is complex because <clears throat> had I stayed in Cuba, I would have tried to continue to do the films the way I was doing them, the style I was doing them. And it's obvious I couldn't. I wouldn't have been able to. It, it is not something theoretical. It happened. They were banned, they were censored, and I couldn't go on. So I had to go out. But as I said yesterday, when I left, I would never have been able to continue that kind of work because I had no interest in commercial cinema. If I had gone into cinema in Cuba, it had been because of the circumstances of the revolution, of the caic, that <clears throat> according to its inception and whatever they wanted, they were not interested in commercial cinema, but in an artistic cinema. And they gave us everything to do these films. They gave us everything except freedom. So it was like giving nothing and we had to leave. Outside Cuba, I wanted to make films, and the only films I could do, I think, are the ones I made, because I was not interested. I probably wouldn't have been able to do films in other countries because I didn't know, but perhaps if I had stayed many years in one place, I would have been able to do a film about these people here, these people there, but it would, ha it would have needed a commercial uh, environment and a product producer, a company distribution. And I wasn't interested in doing that. I wasn't. So the only films I could do were the ones I did. And my example has nothing to do with other people. There are other people that have not my way of thinking. They can adapt. It's very, very, very difficult. But there are people who adapt and who can change. And also people that are very happy changing uh, what they do inside the industry. 
people that were directors and that become photographers or, photo or like Fandinho who became, he was a director in Cuba, Roberto Fandinho, and became an editor in Spain and was very happy working as an editor in Spain. So he, he reinvented himself that way in a specific way. So each person has to find his own way in that sense. Okay, that's great. Uh, I think we have Ricardo. Ricardo. Uno, dos, tres. Me escuchan. Qué bien. Yeah. Yes, we have Ricardo. Thank you. Okay. Uh, dear, uh, I wanted to just send like a question in order to hear you. Uh, you are like uh, a great connoisseur of the cinema of your generation, and you are practically in every film of your generation somehow because you are like I think you are the soul of the of the, of the, those movies because you are like like Nelson Rodriguez in the cinema of the 60s you are everywhere in the cinema of the 80s like your your hand is uh, is my opinion you you are always around uh, in this movement and also generating this uh, you were also generating the spaces the festivals the screenings not also making the movies so I think that I wanted to ask you, what do you think uh, define the films uh, as a general uh, opinion of your generation? What kinds of films you were interested in making them, in making? And what was the approach you had? And, and what problems did you, what problems and what successes did you encounter in the official film industry of those days? And um, well, you can say whatever you want. Like, <laughs> it's like a provocation. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Can you talk about this? Because I want to. Uh, first, I want to say, uh, to Tania Bruguer, to Aparicio, to you. Documenta facilitating you guys for creating this incredible like, Salon de Mayo of, the, of Cuban Contra Cultura. Uh, I don't think an event like this happened in the last several several years. So you, this is exactly the kind of conversation and the kind of empathy and talk that we should be having as people in the living. In, I also want to say that I am very proud in the same guy Fernando, who are two filmmakers who I have followed. And who I respect, La Ciudad de Carpas, is a film that was very important for me. Uh, it was a window to what was happening to some of my friends and to my dear beloved love who left in 1980. And I love the, the humanism, the, the compassion that Minuka in, in those 16 minutes of film. So congratulations. Um, happy Dines Lopez Cuchilán, Ricardo Vega, who could not be on this on this conversation. Very much important filmmakers of that moment. This morning I wake up with Paris uh, the were the song screenshots of around viejo lenguaje y ritual being show a document. It was very emotional. It was like 6 30 in the morning here. I shared it with Mark one the creator of the film. Then he told me you have sent it to him too. Very moving way you have created this kind of uh, poetic justice moment to the work that we did at that time. And this day I think are the for me, important to understand the films that we did in our generation, Children's of the Revolution. The first, the first one who were part of that experiment. One day I, I said in television that on to a generation raised to become heroes, and we had on traders or and, and and that really define who we were about the other uh, uh, the ideology and this, the human being within us. I also think that the sujetos, the sub, the people who populated our 
films by may, they might be fiction or the anti-heroes of the system they, and and that is something and even if our films were in some way more maker or less experimental for others there was this very important need the politics but at the same time the politics to since uh, 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 via the aesthetics, because it was, I think that it was also a very important part, part of uh, aesthetics in many ways protected the politics in our films in some cases. Um, I also want to say something to, to, to elaborate on what Minu and Irene, the Ikai is many things many people into it, but I do have to say, and I think it's fair, that for my generation, the kind of the Taller de Cine del Icai in, in, the, in the mid and late 80s, is possible because there was, was a filmmaker at the head of the institution, Paris, and Alfredo was an ideologue, a filmmaker, a real you know, thing. And that filmmaker was Julio Garcia Espinosa. And it's with created the conversation. A very important artistic and intellectual conversation. We as filmmakers have voices and stories and ideas. And it's Julio Garcia, the creation groups that were very much part of a very important play. And it's in that context with the empathy and the solidarity Solidarity of Julio Garcia Espinosa, all of the work that we did was possible. We were the assistants, the director assistants, the sound assistants, the, the, all the assistants in the industry no wanted to wait 20 years to be able to make our first film. So what, what we were doing, the, direct, the, the, the photographer, the assistant of photography was still the end of, and when we have in our little, in our, we were like four or five different creative groups. Feet, you would say, okay, which one is the, the first script in the list of the that is ready? And then that is this that that was the film that will be produced. There was there was no, there was collaboration. There was there was conversation. Uh, everybody in the group was working in. in each one of our films in a beautiful, it was a little moment of a dream. We also were the products of Perestroika. The Cuban government did not knew that Perestroika was that dangerous. For a moment, we were allowed to dream to be a little bit. And when Castro realized that Perestroika was his Achilles, decided that was the end of the story. And censorship, of course, at all levels, and when we were doing the, the film, you know, the, the first incarnation, uh, uh, we, we have to fight the, 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 the box and the security, the state, the, 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 and, 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 and the, we have our own personal officers, those Compañeros que nos atendían, but in the context of where create something that was quite unique until it is functional and toxic, and you, you can see in the cinema of so Vega, for example, did, did the first film that we did, Retreat para Guaje. There is a, there is an element of romanticism in the way that we, we were able that three years later when the ideologues realized that some of these films as they are not a narrative that we can't control the change change changed and then and they there became the persecutions the people were put in prisons or or crespo or, or or we were visited by the police security we were vigilant, we were watched we were in trouble, 
we were also part of a collective. I remember that Julio, I, I went to see Ration do not know of the cinema of Sara Gomez. And I want to do a case of Sara films to introduce it to our generation. And the second muestra at the cinema, uh, the theater in the, in the uh, Museo Nacional, to, to, to present to, my, to our generation the cinema of Sara Gomez that in, uh, in, uh, you know, put in, in uh, you know, put in the dark for so long. It was a beautiful moment of poetic justice, of generational collaboration. We also went to see Julio and Seth a, a showcase called Ojo Pinta, wet paint, that thing that you put in the benches when you. And the idea was, was to show the open prima of many of the filmmakers of Minuka and Sergio Giral and Pastor Vega and you name it. those first films as part of the films that we were also making many never have been seen before because they were forbidden they were they were better for the first time at the Cine La Rampa together with our films and that was the from being los muchachos to become filmmakers of our own act of empathy with the filmmakers of the 60s and 70s we all became the same the, the same guys the same this the same this is a conversation about art freedom filmmaking versus censorship i, uh, I don't know if i'm extending to my with this, but um, it does. I wanted to talk uh, and because for me, also, one thing that was very important in that moment is saying, Well, okay, we all know have the same aesthetics, we all know where the same people and very powerful and beautiful. There was the fact of empathy and collaboration in between, very, very different. And, and the muestra the scene was an example where we will respect your aesthetics and my aesthetics because we both have the uh, a, a right to exist and to respect and to have a voice and that was very because that is something that they could not control you know that they decided that they will bound uh, any information on, on our side eh? that we will do something very very interesting which was we will give this of this this of of, of, of the festival in radio reloj at 8, 8 p.m in the cine la rampa we start here in radio reloj imagine that we will have the guts to give to get inside y tomar radio reloj which is so much embody on the collective memory and give the awards of our cinema, our filmmakers on the, the next day of course we have a big, big fight with everybody but that was a very good disobedience and creativity in a way and um, wanted to thank you Ricardo for making such a synthetic but profound and very thoughtful um, examination of your time, the time of the generation started making movies. Um, I, I think it's beautiful to have this, uh, this conversation because it tends a bridge between like two different generations that were supposed to not have a contact between each other but now that um, um, you can watch, uh, as I can do it, watch the films that Minuk and Fernando uh, did in Cuba and outside of Cuba, and they can watch the films that you did in the 80s and also the films that you made in the diaspora, I think it's part of a tradition. And we are building that from the scratch because it was not supposed to happen because powers and governments don't always... Uh, they don't like us to be communicated, to be reunited, to have a dialogue between each other, because that's the way we collect experience 
uh, as a tradition, as a family, uh, 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 and that's how we become stronger uh, in order to, to overcome censorship, to overcome abuse of power, to overcome the idea that memory can be erased, and now we are rebuilding that memory, and I think it's a beautiful bridge to have this conversation, as it was beautiful to screen today, first uh, films by Marco Antonio Abad, by Juan Carlos Cremata, uh, by Irene Lopez Cuchilan, and after that, uh, watching the films that Minuka and Fernando uh, made during the 70s uh, in New York. Uh, and I think um, that's the idea, to have all this collective uh, dialogue between all these different generations of Cuban filmmakers that have gone to, through some similar experiences um, and rebuilding this, this idea as a counter-tradition and counter-canon to widen, to, to open um, the, the idea of what Cuban film really is. And I, I, I feel closer to, to you. I feel like, uh, like we are the new outsiders, the new misfits. And I thank a lot to you for being here today, for sharing your experiences. Uh, I, I, I apologize for all the, the, the kind of technical chaos this kind of hybrid events always have, because it's kind of difficult to coordinate so many people in different parts of the, of the world. But I think the idea is that we are, this is an act of resistance to to be here no matter what and to talk about all that we've been through. And this is not a final conversation. We'll continue talking in the future and writing and creating this memory. And like, like yesterday, we screened La Imagen Rota, The Broken Image, a documentary by Sergio Giral of 1995 about the exiled generation of filmmakers, three exiled generation of Cuban filmmakers. And now there are like four or five, and maybe generations of, of Cuban film filmmakers going into exile. So I think we can talk about a diasporic tradition too. Uh, um, well, thank you for being here. Thank you for, uh, to Instar and Documenta and Tania Bruguera for creating these spaces. And thank you uh, all, all the people who have watched the, the conference here and on their homes via internet. And yeah, uh, continue following these conversations every day uh, at the same hour uh, by Instar Live. Um, well, thank you. Uh, thank you, Ricardo. Thank you, Rene. Thank you, Minuka and Fernando. Thank you. And thank you all. I want to, to thank you, all the young people from Cuba who are making film, independent film. And for us, it has been a pleasure and happiness to see your film, people. I know it's very difficult. And uh, we are your friends. And I am happy that you have been watching our film and have discovered them. Thank you so much. And also thank you to Jose Luis to, to invite us here and to make such a beautiful group of film in Rialta, no? You have it this in Rialta. And thank you so much. And thank you, Tania Brugueda with Instar for inviting us here. Okay? Bye. Bye. Thank you.